Hi everyone, I'm Lauren, one of the co-founders of h and Studio, and thanks for tuning in this week for our third online panel discussion episode. This week, we're covering Art and Archaeology, featuring Nicholas Cox tuning in from the University of Cambridge in England. Before we get going, I want to go over a few housekeeping tidbits. Firstly, we're looking for sponsors for this series, but not in a traditional sense. We're looking to try and support other small local businesses. So for example, if you're a brewery, give us a couple cans of your beer. You don't have to write us a check or anything, but we'll definitely and enthusiastically share the word about your beer and your product during this live stream. Secondly, this panel was pre-recorded due to a difference in time zones. So please be aware of that. And that leads to the third point. During the time of this pre-recording, there were huge wildfires going on not too far from our studio here in Southwest Florida. So if something seems a little glitchy with the video, that's just the recording and our apologies for that as the internet connection was a little bit affected by those fires. So that being said, thanks again for joining us and enjoy this episode of Art and Archaeology featuring Nicholas Cox. Hey Nick. Hey Nick. Thanks for hey joining guys. us for this for this pre-recorded panel discussion on art and archaeology. It's really cool because obviously, as you know, it's not every day you get to talk to a real life archaeologist. Not every day that I get interviewed as well. So this is very exciting. <laughs> <laughs> very cool. So I I guess um, maybe we'll start this with what may be a very very broad question that may reach back into you know quite a few years into your life but have you always known that you were going to study archaeology and and about when did you embark on the journey of, of doing what you're currently doing so i did not always know i wanted to be an archaeologist but I have seen evidence in my childhood that I knew I wanted the job I have now. I just didn't know what it was. Mm -hmm. um, so for my undergrad, I studied politics and international relations because I thought I could either be a journalist or a diplomat. Mm -hmm. uh, two very different career paths, but both of them are <laughs> politics. Yeah. Um, and then it was when I was working in Bolivia as a journalist mm -hmm. um, in 2015, 2016. And when I was out there, I was writing a lot of articles for a tourism magazine. And I went to a lot of archaeological ruins at the time because it was sort of an interest I had. Mm -hmm. uh, and about the same time, I was admitted to Cambridge University for a master's program. And you sort of had the choice of what do you want to study at Cambridge? And I'm like, well, I'm really enjoying looking at ruins right now. I was a little tipsy the night I actually completed the application, uh, quite tipsy. And so I said, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll do archaeology. I mean, I just came back from Lake Titicaca, where it's on the Inca temples. Mm -hmm. And then I come back to La Paz. I'm like, all right, archaeology, that's what I'll do. Uh, so it sounds like it was a very snap decision. Uh, but having said that, I, um, my parents dug up an, a school project I did when I was about 12. And... It was one of these sort of school projects where you do a little bit of creative writing, a little bit of research, you do a little bit of like sculpting, art, painting. They just get you to do a little bit of everything. And the premise was you've been marooned in an isolated location. You have to write the diary of this person getting back to salvation, etc. And a part of that was you had to draw a before and after picture of your fictional character. And my parents found this and sent it to me and they said, Nick, this looks just like you today and it's really unnerving because when i was 12 i didn't look like how i do now but i mm -hmm. effectively drew a little picture of what i look like now as an archaeologist as sort of like this adventurer character i'd invented as a child so there's clearly been a subliminal direction leading me to this point but the actual decision to get a degree in archaeology and work in archaeology on the surface looks very spontaneous Thank God you were tipsy because maybe all of that bubbled up to the surface to become clear and lucid as a result. So <laughs> I think that's, yeah, probably, yeah, you know, I really got in touch with myself. Uh, that's so that, really awesome. Yeah. We, I, I feel a similar trajectory in that I, I started studying art formally uh, at a relatively later age myself. So again, kind of 
that realization, you know, a few years behind what a lot of other people do. But then I was always the token kid drawing. Yes. So yeah. we, were, we were both kind of the token kids drawing, it seems like, but, but yours was <laughs> a little more prophetic. <laughs> so Yeah, it, it's very unnerving. I, I can actually send that picture to you. Um, yeah, we'd love that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I did not think to send it, um, but it's on my Instagram and I'll send it to you. I've got a side, I've got a side by side because we had to draw the before and the after. And the mm -hmm. after doesn't look like me because this man's very haggard and sunburned. Uh, but the before, it really does. Because like recently I was in Colombangra, I was in the Solomon Islands doing mm -hmm. a, a research project, which we'll probably get to in a moment. Yeah, but yeah. the picture I drew is of like that neck with the exact same hat and beard it's very weird oh that's really yeah. that's really awesome that's really awesome so and and how is it um you know as as maybe ignorant as, as this may sound what does studying archaeology at cambridge entail are you kind of thrown into the practical aspect of it a lot more quickly and especially given that you came from a very Again, international relations, journalism, politics yeah. background. How did you transition from all of that skill set to acquiring this new one? So the great benefit of a master's program in archaeology at Cambridge is that you do not need to have studied it in the past mm -hmm. to be able to do it now because they do, do give you a ground, from the ground up kind of crash course mm -hmm. where effectively because uh, a master's program in Britain is a year long. And effectively, during that, yeah, it's 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 a very it's a very short window. And during that time, um, they effectively give you a crash course in what the undergrads have three years to work with. While at the same time, you're meant to be working on your master's thesis as well. Mm -hmm. So it's the way they manage it is by making it the most stressful and exhausting year of your life because you're effectively doing three years worth of work at the same time as one year's worth of work all simultaneously uh, but there's there's very little practical this is this is the problem with just coming at a master's level mm -hmm. is most of your field experience is gathered uh during your undergrad um mm. for an yes most of my co-workers and colleagues today uh have studied it since their undergrads and mm -hmm. during your undergrad when you go to the um summer digs your university organizes that's when you volunteer to dig with various organizations abroad and often universities you have to do at least two week two weeks of field research to even like pass your undergrad each year that's an expectation mm -hmm. uh so last year uh, i was supervising uh, undergraduate students because i now work for the university of cambridge as one of their field archaeologists mm -hmm. so i was supervising the undergrads giving them the field experience that i actually did not get through my degree because my degree starts with the assumption that you probably have already Mm -hmm. done undergrad in this um although what i did had done is after i finished high school but before i started my degree i did volunteer on a few archaeological digs mm -hmm. before i knew i wanted to be an archaeologist i still thought i'd be a diplomat but i volunteered on these digs because it was something that always interested me uh so that was really the only field experience i had going into my formal study of it and my entire degree at Cambridge was spent mainly in the library. Um, there was no field work. Uh, so that, that, so uh, yeah, starting at Cambridge at a master's level, you don't get the field experience you would if you came into archaeology at a lower level. But I do feel from that point forward, I've actually got a lot of practical experience in the field. So it has worked out, I feel. Yeah. Is it, is it kind of like one of those instances where... Um, as you were, as you've been guiding the the undergrads, you have the opportunity to kind of create the field experience for them that maybe you you wish you could have had, or or that you could have amalgamated from different bits of your experience into what you feel is kind of an ideal. Well, the, the nice thing was, by the time that I was supervising the undergrads, I'd worked for two separate archaeological companies. I had my masters, mm -hmm. um, and I had now volunteered. Uh, um, I've now volunteered by this point as an archaeologist on various volunteer digs. So I did have a little bit of background, which I could impart onto the undergrad students. Uh, and when I was 18, when I was 18 and I did this volunteer dig, it was a very informative and influential two week period. So yeah. I sort of, I remember that incredibly fondly. Um, and I took a lot from what I learned then to sort of impart to the undergrads when I was 
training them consequently. Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't quite the same because the volunteer dig I was on was in Spain. Everyone lived in a great big cabin together and there was a lot of drinking, whereas this was organized by the university and therefore uh, you had your professors kind of hovering everywhere, making sure that no one was uh, misbehaving. <laughs> yeah, I can, I, can, I can fathom, you know, a little bit of Rioja <laughs> in the mix might, might, uh, might uh, mm -hmm. complicate things a little. And, and I think mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I mean, archaeology volunteer digs are famous for being places where everyone gets rip-roaringly drunk during the night and digs during the day. It's one of the stereotypes archaeologists have, and I think it's earned, is that they do drink a lot, especially when they're in the field. Um, it's not quite as easy when you are representing the University of Cambridge. Uh, yeah, yeah. Makes I imagine. Sense. I imagine. And I, I guess that, and that does, again, lead me to um, Colin Bangara in that I, I was wondering if you could tell us about that expedition and then, you know, I, I wanted to follow that up with how that experience, maybe maybe it wasn't so different from a, from a university dig or a volunteer dig. But yeah, tell us about that whole thing front to back what you did because it's so cool and it's so amazing that you i don't want to say spearheaded because maybe that's a very appropriate pun given what people think archaeological artifacts look like but that you totally from the ground up organized led funded this expedition um highlighting a part of history that a lot of people just really seem to gloss over yeah it was it kind of came out of nowhere the project um last year i was taking my parents and some of their family friends on a tour around cambridge and actually at that time i was working on a dig within the city itself so i took my my uh, parents and their friends into a car park so we could actually look down to the dig i was working on it was a mm -hmm. roman dig because nearly everything in britain that i work with is roman mm -hmm. but i spent nearly the entire time um, with these people, middle of summer last year, just lecturing them on archaeology. And then one of them mentioned, one of my uh, parents' friends, mentioned that in 1995 he had been working on the Solomon Islands mm -hmm. um, on a sustainable forestry initiative. And he'd been on this island called Columbangara. Mm -hmm. And the locals that he was working with, and he was effectively trying to help them set up a sustainable forestry industry that was indigenous run and maintained because prior to that had been run really by, well, formerly it was a colonial country. So it was under the influence of uh, British um, imperial authority. Mm -hmm. And this was sort of a transition, sort of establishing indigenous run businesses. Uh, he was there with the Commonwealth Development Committee and that's by the by, but he was on the island of Columbangara and the people he worked with one day sort of said, you know, let's get in a boat. There's these, tunnels but there's a tunnel that you should come have a look at and they took him out into the jungle and they took him to what they were described as the hospital tunnel which was apparently a hospital underground that the japanese had occupied during the second world war wow so when the japanese had sort of swept down through the pacific in the um early 40s mm -hmm. uh they they came as far as the solomon islands and Kombangra was one of the islands that came under their imperial authority and what he was told is that this tunnel, <clears throat> um, which has it had, he, he told me, sort of bottles of medicine, bottles of sake, uh, all these kind of artifacts, um, tables, medical operating tables, stretcher beds, all this kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, we were all just lying in there. Oh and this is what he kind of described to me that he sort of saw in 1995. And this got me thinking, oh, I thought, I wonder if this tunnel still exists. And I looked into it. Mm -hmm. And the first proof to me is that it still exists was that nothing had ever been written about it. So obviously, if he was telling the truth, it had never been discovered. It was just local knowledge. And he was the first non-islander to ever visit the tunnels. Wow. And so I started looking into what Colin Bangra was. And I investigated it for a little bit. And it was this island that got really sort of caught up um, in the Second World War. It sort of became the hub of Japanese occupation for a period when all the other islands fell to the Americans. The Japanese withdrew to this one island and heavily defended it. Um, but then the Americans never fought for that island. They ignored it and attacked a lighter defended island. So the Japanese were completely cut off. Mm. And then in October... November 1943, uh, over the course of three nights, the entire Japanese garrison of 12,000 men evacuated 
in boats and fled the island and mm -hmm. many of the boats were sunk but they all sort of fled to Bougainville and so all the artifacts in the tunnel is ostensibly all the stuff that was too heavy for the Japanese to carry on the nights they evacuated. Wow. Uh, so this was learned through my background reading and then I contacted um, an indigenous organization on the island called Kolombangra Biodiversity, Kolombangra Island Biodiversity Conservation Association or KIBCA mm -hmm. and started talking to uh, indigenous um, uh, landowners through this organization. We sort of agreed that this is a conservation ecology and cultural preservation initiative. They're, they're running on the island. And so, of course, they were very excited at the pr prospect of an archaeological excavation of their relics and ruins taking place because they don't really understand the significance either, but they know it's important. So they'd love to learn more. Yeah. So we sort of started talking to them. We established that there was a landowner who was more than happy to take us out to his, um, his, the jungle that he owns so we could visit this tunnel. Mm -hmm. uh, and that being the basis, I started a crowdfunding campaign, a GoFundMe campaign. But it was all very, well, the idea was we'd make a documentary about it and write lots of articles and do a lot of like, you know, all, across all media platforms kind of yeah. promotion of the. But we didn't really know what we were going to expect to find. So it was, I'm very grateful that we, we raised over what we'd initially hoped. Mm -hmm. It was amazing the amount of people that had faith in this expedition working, considering that what I've told you is all I knew about it. I knew the historical context. So I knew in 1995 there was a tunnel which mm -hmm. had medical equipment in, and that was the limit of our knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, so I started talking to people, and, my, and the university got interested, and they put me on to the Durand Group, which is a – a military or well it's a former military men who now are archaeologists and they specialize in excavating wartime tunnels mm -hmm. and major andy hawken from this organization joined in on the team because we thought we might find japanese bombs we weren't sure we had no idea what to expect but there could be grenades and explosives so wow. now we have sort of organizations joining in mm -hmm. and one of my friends martin he said to me, kind of like, well, if you need a cameraman, I'll come along. So the team was thus assembled, Andy from the Durand Group and my friend from University, Martin, and I uh, went off to Columbangra really with no clue what to expect. Um, we had some old wartime maps that um, a researcher here at the university, Amy, was able to find, but that was the limit of what we had. And the maps didn't show the tunnels we were looking at because... As I've now confirmed, the Allies had no idea that the Japanese defences went this far east. So where we were going was never recorded by Allied intelligence. Oh. Um, and then, yeah, we sort of showed up the island. We were introduced to the landowner. We hopped into his um, motorised canoe after settling into Ringi Village, which is effectively a, a large logging camp. Mm -hmm. Tourists don't really go to this island. They have no... We, we were staying in a cabin that... Uh, visitors to the logging camp normally stay in. That's where we were. Mm -hmm. And we took out the motorized canoe to the jungle and were amazed to discover that not only was there this tunnel with the medical equipment, there were actually six tunnels running along the ridge, yeah. five of which by the end of our two week period, we were able to enter. And each tunnel had its own specific purpose. And they were just full, like full of artifacts. Like it's a good day as an archeologist when you dig your hole and you find a bone or a piece of pottery, and we were sort of wading through all this discarded detritus of the Japanese occupation. And the amazing thing, what I've found in research since coming back, is that um, this wasn't just sort of any or any group of men living in these tunnels. They were the um, they were called the Special Naval Landing Forces. The Japanese Army and Navy, for very complicated reasons, never really cooperated. They had their own separate organizations that did effectively the same thing so that special naval landing forces were the J japanese navy's land-based organization that historical records say were based on the island but on every single intelligence map they've never been located no one knew where they were they just knew they were somewhere on the island and by chance we have found the headquarters where this organization of oh um were based and we were able to deduce that because we found gas masks bottles uh and shoes that are distinctively part of the uniform worn by the special naval landing forces so wow. not only were we creating tunnels that no one had really seen since the japanese abandoned them mm -hmm. but we were now able to i've even i've been able to work out which it was the eighth combined 
that's the name of the unit of men who are posted there and no one knew where they were like that's just they never they were in historical records they were on the island but not a single allied map knew where they were located and now we have found that so that's really i mean that was a very long response but that's kind of no that's from, that's from the idea through to the research i'm now currently trolling through upon our return yeah, yeah, and it's it's especially pertinent, I think, um, to the fact that who's watching this may be, may be more than American families because um, a lot of American families who have World War II vets, I, I, I think there's more, at least from my understanding, who served in the Pacific Theater. And so this actually might be a little bit more relevant in some ways transatlantically, at least, at least for us. It's really interesting too, what you said about the landowner who had the tunnels, which um, you know makes me think of what may be a very uh, a very basic question regarding archaeology, but one that I, I I've always kind of wondered is when you do discover something like this, is it typically on privately owned land or like you hear about discovering um, Richard the Third or whatever in a car park in Lancaster, you know, like how. Uh, you know, when, when you're doing a dig, I'm guessing if, since it was entirely privately done by you, it was very easy for you to connect with the property owner and do what you had to do, I, I'm not even on his property, but in the tunnels of his property. Um, is that different than a usual dig? Do you usually have to go in and get some sort of municipal permission? Is it usually public land that you're doing a dig on? How does that usually it really varies from country to country, organization to organization. Um, and also time period to time period, there's this interesting thing where if you find medieval archaeology or later on your land in Britain, mm -hmm. it belongs to the government. But if you find Roman or earlier, that is yours to decide what to do with. Wow. Um, interesting. Yeah. yeah it, it's almost, it's, it's very interesting. It's sort of, you know, when Britain becomes Britain, when the Anglo-Saxons establish the first English kingdom, from that point forward, archaeology found is a lot more difficult to claim as your own. But if it's Roman or earlier, you can do what you like with that in Britain. Mm -hmm. um, and again, with the company I work with, which is the Cambridge Archaeology Unit, um, <clears throat> we often work alongside contractors who might be construction workers or quarry workers. Mm -hmm. And we work alongside them providing an archaeological service because in Britain, the rules are you can't really build or dig holes in the ground without archaeologists surveying it and at least removing or preserving the artifacts first. Mm -hmm. And after that being done, then you can begin construction or mining or quarrying, whatever it is that um, the land is set to be used for. So that's actually an understanding in Britain, but it's not like that in other countries necessarily. Uh, and it's it, regarding the Solomon Islands, it was a, that was a tricky one for me because mm. there is a stigma against archaeologists, which is earned about the idea of you know sort of white colonial men going off to other parts of the world and taking archaeology back to Europe to sort of put in their museums. I mean, all the best artifacts you'll find in Berlin or London uh, were stolen from North Africa and um, Mesopotamia. Yeah. So it's, it's, a, it's in, in the modern world, you want to avoid that. And so it's, it's really important to, when you're organizing um, excavations like this, it's so important that you make sure you're working with the complete permission and understanding of the local landowners mm -hmm. to make sure that this isn't just some obtuse organization showing up and saying, this is significant, and then leaving with it. And actually what we did with the Columbangra project was we didn't remove anything um, from the land itself. What we did is we would, we would walk through the tunnels or scuttle, very hard to stand upright in these tunnels. Yeah. And we would take ex extensive photos of the tunnels. We would map all the tunnel walls. I've actually got my um, maps next to me here. So we would very delicately on permatrace measure out the extent of the tunnel systems. Wow. Um, this isn't the best one to show you because this is one the Japanese actually never finished. So it, its purpose, we don't know. But I'll show you the hospital. So that's the one they call the hospital. It's actually too small to be a hospital. It's more of a dressing station. Mm -hmm. um, there, there's enough room for a stretcher bed to go in here, okay. to go in there. So 
<clears throat> so yeah, we would go through the tunnels, we would map everything, photograph all the artifacts in situ, uh, which is sort of just where we find it in the ground. And then if we found a unique piece that we hadn't seen elsewhere or something that looked significant, we would take it out of the tunnel, clean it off, photograph it in the daylight. And what we did is we would take about 100 photos from different angles of a single artifact. Mm -hmm. And what my co-workers in Cambridge have now been able to do, and it's amazing, is they stitch all those photos mm -hmm. into a mesh. And now we have videos that show every angle of the artifact as if it's physically in front of you. Mm -hmm. And... By doing this, it meant we never needed to remove any artifacts for later examination. Once photographed, and now that they're being three-dimensionally modeled, mm -hmm. we effectively have a virtual copy of that artifact that's available to anyone with an internet connection. And once we photograph the artifacts, we would then return them where we'd found them in the tunnel. And we would explain everything we had found to Cendric. Cendric was the landowner. He's the man that owned the jungle we're working in. And we'd made copies of the map. So Cendric knows everything we learned. And not a single artifact has left his property. Only photos have. And this was important not only because we wanted to undertake archaeology in a way that wouldn't be construed as invasive or neo-colonial it's a it was a lot of I, I got that thrown around a lot before this expedition went underway so I the onus was on me to make sure that that was not how it would appear uh, but also um, archaeology in itself is an act of destruction because by the time you're finished uh, doing archaeology all that's left is an absence where once there was an artifact um, if you're digging up ruins, by the time the ruins have been excavated, there's nothing that made that ground significant. And if you're digging up burials, you know, by the time the burial is, is uprooted and it's off various parts of it, often different museums, mm -hmm. it no longer has the relevance to it. And what we were thinking was with the tunnels at the, the region is called Teme. It's um, in Kolombangra. In the jungle tunnels at Teme, all the artifacts there, it's kind of like a Marie Celeste. You know, the Japanese just dropped it all. They fled the tunnels overnight, and then they've just stayed there for 77 years. So all the artifacts where they lie are a, a window, a snapshot of this chaotic couple of nights mm -hmm. uh, when these men fled the tunnels and retreated across the ocean. Mm -hmm. And to remove these artifacts would they would just become trinkets. By the time that, you know, if you find a hand grenade in the ground where it was dropped by a scared Japanese Navy man, by the time it's cleaned on display in a museum, it's just another wartime trinket. But if it stays in the mud of the tunnel where it was dropped, it is part of the story that makes it significant. Mm -hmm. um, so it was to both undertake excavation and archaeology with complete transparency with local landowners mm -hmm. um, and also to make sure that the the pertinence of their positioning within the landscape wasn't violated by the excavation. So those were the two things that really drove us to do a very sort of um, audio visual kind of excavation rather than a more tangible one. I think, I think that's great. And I think it, it goes back to, I think we had a question submitted through our mailing list um, wondering where the artifacts were being stored now. So that answers that very well. And it sounds to me like this expedition really epitomized maybe archaeology for the 21st century, and that you have this lovely vacillation between a very holistic, very ethical approach. There's a very, very even, equal cooperation with a local population. Um, but then also you have the benefit of technology that can ensure that every, you know, that kind of sets everything up to, to be holistic, ethical. It's really cool how you can go from um, a much more human and kind of, organic means of working and that that's facilitated by you know you know cameras and being able to make 3d models and and things like that yeah. that's really really cool. I mean, someone pointed out to me that thanks to us now mapping these onto three-dimensional space if one of us had a printer we could now print off a one-to-one -one replica of these artifacts oh. which would then mean it like and i hadn't really thought of it like that but i think you raise a good point that you know it's, it is an example of how archaeology doesn't have to be bogged down in the stereotypes uh, of the 18 and early 1900s that kind of inform all of our perception of archaeology. I'm a huge fan of Indiana Jones. Maybe my first exposure to archaeology was through Indiana Jones. Yeah. And those films kind of exemplify 
the problematic aspects of archaeology, which is robbery of artifacts from local people, and also the destruction and violation of sacred spaces. Um, and another thing we actually worked alongside is we had this huge anthropological aspect to the expedition where we wanted to get indigenous wartime narratives because, mm -hmm. you know, everyone knows about the Pacific campaign. It's a, a hugely important part of the war, but the experience of indigenous people uh, in the Solomon Islands who, like for them, it wasn't, you know, Guadalcanal wasn't uh, a battlefield. Guadalcanal was where they had their farms and their boats and their homes. So it's, it's a different kind of perspective of the conflict. Mm -hmm. And so I made sure to speak as often as I could to um, whoever would be willing to talk to me uh, while I was out there to try and glean indigenous accounts of the war so we could present this new narrative, the narrative of indigenous suffering and heroism during the Second World War. And that actually had some really amazing results where I ended up speaking to the son of one of eight men who was responsible for saving the life of John F. Kennedy during the Second World War. So um, JFK, this is a whole other story, but his boat was sunk off the coast of Columbangara. They actually made a movie about this uh, in the 60s, not long after he became president. Mm -hmm. And Kennedy was incredibly heroic and brave during this ordeal. Um, and that does come across in the film that was made in the 60s. But what doesn't come across in the film is the endeavors and efforts of the indigenous scouts to try and save him because there were a lot of indigenous scouts who were effectively guerrilla fighters uh, resisting the Japanese and assisting the Americans throughout the um, Pacific campaign. In the oh, in, in the and I was able to meet the son of one of the eight scouts who'd worked in that area and this man had been responsible um, to, for bringing food to Kennedy, for taking Kennedy to meet. There's also an Australian man who was in hiding on one of the islands spying on the Japanese. And so this is all quite a famous story, but to actually meet one of the men who had facilitated Kennedy meeting this Australian and bringing the food and the water and um, supplies to the marooned American sailors. And as they smuggled Kennedy from one island to another, they had a Japanese plane fly down to like, have a look at them. They had to hide Kennedy under um, palm fronds. Mm -hmm. And so this is like, this was really interesting too, because the story of Kennedy and the sinking of his boat, which was called PT-109, is very famous. Uh, but it's very much told from the perspective of um, the American forces during the war, because they're the ones who went back and told the story. And for the scouts who were working with the Allies, but were indigenous fishermen mainly, mm -hmm. um, they just went back to their homes and their life continued. Um, mm -hmm. they, they actually did receive letters from Kennedy once he became president. And I saw these signed letters sent to the families of the men I was interviewing, oh um, which is dedicated to them by John F. Kennedy, who he never forgot the sacrifice these men made and the risks they took to rescue him. Uh, but the world kind of has, and as, as, the, as the years have gone on, that story has moved on and the efforts of indigenous people has been forgotten more and more. Uh, so that was another element of the expedition that we really wanted to focus on. Oh, wow. But I, I apologize. No, I think, I think that's fascinating. That's really, really fascinating. And again, it does kind of, you know, stitch into, um, you know, the concept of, of media, you know, as something... Mm that's relevant to archaeology because, you know, all of this is happening during a time in which you had cameras and video cameras. And, and the thing that for me is so harrowing about for certainly the first and second world wars is, is that, you know, and, and again, you see this in Matthew Brady's photos of the American civil war is when technology and media gets to the point where it can start documenting all of this and confronted with the horrors or the narratives behind it that history has largely forgotten. It's, it's, you know, to me, that's, very, very poignant. And um, I mean, I don't know much about what happened in the Pacific theater during World War II, but I know that the Japanese culturally had a very, very convoluted and messy history with a lot of the other native peoples of Asia. So I bet that's a whole other, you know, I, I can just see the potential for what you're doing in Columbara, Columbangra being totally, totally limitless in terms of it being an untapped, um, you know, area of knowledge regarding what's actually maybe a fairly recent bit of history so yeah it's, it's very recent and that's actually the thing about archaeology is that people sort of look at you doing research into the second world war and that doesn't fit for many people into their common perception of archaeology which is normally you know romans and egyptians but 
really, if it's in the ground and you can dig it up, it's archaeology. And yeah. Second World War archaeology is um, what they call conflict archaeology or recent conflict archaeology. And it's a, it's a new field. As the war gets further and further away from us, mm -hmm. the idea of digging it up, uh, because history books have been written, of course, history books are written on anecdotal and first-hand evidence, but... Um, History deals with the truth, whereas I feel archaeology deals with facts in that everyone will give a different account of what happened, even if it's only slightly different, whereas archaeology is incontrovertible what you find on the ground. And I feel the two working together gives an incredibly full and fulfilling picture of whatever period you're examining. I found that because I've been writing a very long report on indigenous narratives from the war and trying to reconcile that with the American narratives of the exact same events is very difficult. Whereas the other report I'm writing on the um, Special Naval Landing Forces occupation of the Teme jungles, which is based incontrovertibly off the artifacts I found in the ground, is a lot easier to write because you cannot deny what you find in the ground, but you can always deny uh, the story that someone tells. Uh, but I definitely feel the two can work together really well. And that's a prescient tool to have in any time period. It doesn't have to be ancient history for the benefits of archaeology and history working together mm -hmm. to actually, you know, make some significant changes. Yeah. And then how, how was that dig um, different or maybe parallel to a lot of what you usually do for Cambridge? Um, maybe that was a very loaded question. <laughs> No, no, it's normal. I mean, what I do for Cambridge, firstly, we don't get to choose where we dig. Uh, I mean, it ha we, we go where we are contracted to dig. Um, and you're often, it, you're working alongside people who resent working with archaeologists. The construction industry doesn't like the fact that if an archaeologist finds a um, Neolithic causeway in the field that they want to make into 300 um, little terraced houses, we won't let them build those houses until we have excavated and researched the causeway and decided whether the causeway can be covered in houses or if it must be preserved and made into a, a monument. Um, and that really annoys construction workers because we all we do is slow down construction. Um, so you're working with people that don't really like the fact you're there. Oh, some are fantastic, though, to be honest. Some construction workers love archaeologists, and they yeah. pop over, and their minds are blown by the artifacts we find, but it, it really depends. Mm -hmm. um, and you don't really get to choose where you're digging, uh, and a lot of the archaeology that we're finding, you know, it's sometimes it's iffy. It's often Neolithic, Bronze Age, uh, a lot of Roman, a huge amount of Roman, I've got a very soft spot for Romans because all I do is dig up Roman stuff in Britain. Yeah. Um, sometimes medieval, but often medieval remains uh, already, you know, part of, you know, medieval Britain very much gave rise to modern Britain. So modern houses are built in the, the shells of medieval houses. But the Roman stuff was often out by itself. Mm -hmm. uh, but the biggest difference is I feel um, with that, because I had complete autonomy on this, I was able to do whatever I considered to be the best approach to certain situations. Mm -hmm. And the benefit of working from a purely archaeological perspective rather than working um, alongside a uh, construction um, industry mm -hmm. is that we could take as long as we wanted and we could be as uh, thorough and academic as we wanted because often the academic and educational side of archaeology and commercial archaeology, which is what I do, is lost because you have to work to a timeline yeah. set by organizations that are not archaeological. Mm -hmm. So we work, this will say, you know, you've got three months to excavate this field because we want to start quarrying the gravel afterwards. Mm -hmm. And three months might not be enough for you to adequately understand the Roman trading hub that is built in this field, but that's the time period you have to work with. Whereas yeah. in Columbangra, we were completely masters of our own direction. So we were able to be as archaeological as in depth um, and take as many breaks as we wanted. Do you think there's going to be a lot more future expeditions like the one you led in Columbang? I like to think so. I mean, this is a very weird time for, for everyone in the world right now. I don't need to go into the nature of COVID-19. It does mean that I can't do archaeology anymore because if you're meant to stay home and isolate, it doesn't really work alongside my job, which is going outside and digging holes. Yeah. Um, but my hope is after all of this is over and the world 
returns to whatever the new normal will be mm-hmm. is that yeah. I think I have done enough and discovered enough with this expedition to be able to inspire return trips to Columbangra awesome. and many more things as well. Mm-hmm. Very cool. Fantastic. Very cool. Yeah. yeah that's, um, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, um, it's really interesting, um, to me, um, um, since I make sculpture, how you are, you know, starting to work with, um, um, 3d models and, it sounded like you were talking about, um, about, uh, about, uh, about, um, about, um, photogrammetry, the idea of, you know, taking a bunch of, a bunch, a bunch of pictures and, you know, sticking them all together to, um, uh, to create, you know, um, um, a three dimensional object. And, um, I, and, and, uh, in my world is, you know, starting to move in that, you know, same direction, you know, making sculpture. Um, I, I've, I've actually, um, um, yeah, actually, I have a friend who um, lives in New Jersey uh, who has spent um, who has spent a lot of time um, 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 making molds and casting um, um, uh, um, fossilized animal bones to um, reproduce um, um, all sorts of you know dinosaurs and other um, extinct animals to be you know put into museums. Uh, and so mold making is a huge part of what I do. And uh, it, it's, you know, it's very, you know, closely related to how um, archaeology is, 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 is uh, displayed. And it's interesting to see, you know, that those same technical, te- technological changes that are, that, that, are, that are affecting my field are, you know, also um, affecting yours and giving you, you know, all kinds of new um, opportunities. That's so interesting, actually. I'd love to talk to your friend as well. That sounds awesome. <laughs> it, is, it is really interesting. I feel art and archaeology, um, sculpture especially, there are so many ways that the two fields feed into each other. Mm-hmm. Um, there's, Of course, there is the art in the artifacts which you're excavating, but of course, there is, an, the way you say it, I've never really thought of it before, there is a great deal of art that goes into the actual practice of undertaking an archaeological expedition and actually digging stuff up Mm -hmm. um and it's really interesting to think about sort of the future of like three-dimensional imaging it is exactly photogrammetry as as you say that's fair as well yeah it's it's both it's it's visual documentation you know uh, for for a lot of both fields and and i would imagine you know you, you see these beautiful illustrations done by you know john james audubon you know you know, in the U.S. in the 18th century and how, you know, having at least a bit of draftsmanship was really integral before cameras and modern technology to be able to document things. And so I would, I would imagine it might have been similar for, for the more, as you were saying, the more uh, stereotypical Indiana Jones kind of work. And, uh, and I, I wonder sometimes if you do find certain artifacts where, uh, are, you, are you ever in, in a, pinch where you do have to do a quick sketch or something in the field or All the time. Uh, really? so sketching, sketching and art is a very big part of archaeology my um master's thesis was based around um paleolithic bead cultures and the idea was could you trace the movement of various socio-cultural groups during the last ice age through the transmission of ideas of artistry mm. and Oh. To do that, I had to study an exhaustive list of different types of beads, pendants, and other sort of um, ornaments that would, would have been worn on the body by um, Paleolithic people. Mm-hmm. And to do that, I had to illustrate a vast catalogue of all the different types of bead. So that was my first exposure to archaeological illustration. Mm-hmm. which is a huge part to this day because um, and it's all mainly done by hand. <clears throat> and I've got some very talented friends of mine who work at the company. Uh, and what they'll do is once we've dug all our stuff up in the fields, we will return it to, to the office and they will take our pottery shirts or our big pieces of preserved wood or whatever it is. And they will painstakingly draw scale illustrations of that. And they'll draw the, um, the matrix that you can see in sort of the side of a pot and things like this. And in the fields too, we have to do a lot of illustration as well. Even if we're not necessarily drawing these beautiful detailed pen and pencil drawings of the artifacts themselves, every single feature you dig. So 
Archaeology is all about digging features. Features could be pots. Oh, sorry, they could be pits. They could be ditches. It's effectively where prehistoric people create an absence that is then filled in with artifacts. That could be a grave cut. You have to draw that, and you have to draw everything that is in the section of your feature. Um, because you never, you never dig something out in its entirety. You always leave at least half in so you can see the way the earth has fallen in. Okay. So you can see the way the artifacts align, so you can kind of understand how the different pieces were deposited into the same feature. Mm -hmm. And so to do that, you get very good at sort of drawing different types of soil and drawing bones, drawing pots. Um, quick sketches are common, but also there is this me very meticulous and measured uh, artistic side of field work. Uh, and of course, the people who work in the office do the most artistic stuff where they are drawing the brooches and the spearheads and everything in the most beautiful ways possible. Um, and I did a similar thing in my thesis where I was effectively going through catalogues of beads and drawing scale images of every single bead because ideally I could trace a progression or a change in artistic styles mm -hmm. uh, geographically through the changing styles of ornamentation. So there's a lot of the very traditional form of uh, art, both drawing still lifes and also um, draftsmanship that goes on to this day. And I mean, these these maps I have here, these, these plans, mm -hmm. so that, that these are top-down views of the tunnels we had to excavate, that is done across the archeological field. So everyone must be able to draw really yeah. to, to yeah. Not, not draw well necessarily but everyone is expected to be able to draw uh, in order to um, work in the archaeological industry is that is that um is the purpose of drawing just so that you know for example it's before you can get an artifact to a lab or a safe environment in which it can be digitally documented or is it kind of maybe again another facet of a more holistic in that you're kind of you know there are certain things that a camera doesn't pick up that a human eye does that just adds a certain level of completion to the documentation. So lighting, trying to take a photo mm -hmm. uh, of a hole you've excavated really relies on good lighting. And even with the best lighting, a mm -hmm. camera will not be able to show that there are actually seven different types of soil filling this well. Mm -hmm. It will just look brown in that camera. But you know, because you've spent three days digging this well, there are actually seven different layers of soil in there, which indicates seven different periods of use. And you know, some of that soil was deposited while the Romans still used the well, and some of that was obviously filled in later, but only you can tell that because you've, you're intimately equated with the dirt. So you draw the sketch. Well, it's not a sketch. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a draft. It's a professional illustration, effectively. And that all is eventually digitized, um, yeah. and that becomes the official record of the artifact. So it is your, you as the archaeologist, your observation of something you're digging ultimately becomes the only source of information available about that subsequently. So you do everything in the offing to make sure that there is never any, any stone that hasn't been unturned by the time it's being published in the um, official papers. Wow. So you, that there is a very important reason for you to be able to draw and plan. That's fascinating. And it, it, it's an interesting parallel because, as you know, we both work fairly anachronistic media ourselves so you know we, we always kind of laugh about how it's you know the fact that we can take like a good photo and share it with instagram and we're kind of incumbent upon technology in a way to kind of preserve this anachronistic media again it, there's these certain dichotomies and, and vacillations and pushes and pulls between the two and it's kind of neat how as time goes on and technology goes on counterintuitively for most people the need to still be able to make things with your own your own digits actually increases in tandem with the need for technological advancement. It is so true. We've often said that as archaeologists, you know, no digital rendering will ever get it quite as close or as accurate as your drawing by eye with a retractable pencil on a piece of permatrace. Wow. So the ability to do something with your hands is is so crucial to archaeology and, and the artistry inherent in that will always remain in that um which is nice to think about yeah yeah it, it really is because a lot of people you know i get questions like what does it feel like to to be one of the people 
left looking in this dying form. And I kind of have the opposite impression on my end. I feel like, well, it's actually kind of proliferating and it's getting yeah. easier and easier to share it with people. And I, I exactly. think, you know that there's certain resurgences that are happening, co happening contradictorily to, you know, what people's impressions are yeah. otherwise. And, and that kind of ties into Nick, your own artwork and your own, right. you are a highly, highly creative guy and it's it's really cool both your writing is beautiful and um and and your drawings are are fascinating so i'm going to really quickly i do feel that it's important to work in tandem with the the advances made in technology to mm -hmm. not resist them but also i feel doing art the old-fashioned way will never actually become old-fashioned i think it will just right. continue so long as it cooperates with technology as well. Uh, everything you've sort of said about the classical style of art you do, I mean, it, it is still in cooperation with technological advances, which is the same with archaeology as well. Yeah. Um, I think we'd struggle if, I would struggle if I was forced to eschew digital media completely, as much though I want to, because I have to admit that the modern world has such a high dependence on that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. No, I think Which, it's just an inherent human compulsion to to record things with with your own hands, you know. And I, I think actually, you know, it's a very very simple example of you know, the proliferation of of Instagram and how people can share visual images and how that's worked so wonderfully for artists and again people who do things in a more anachronistic fashion. It's and again, your, your uh, archaeological work, the fact that you can do something like photogametry now, but yet you still have to have that sketch from the field. It's just a oh, really, yeah. really, really beautiful symbiosis. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, um, there are some, um, there are some interesting psychological things that happen when, like, you know, as humans, we encounter, you know, these artifacts that are handmade. And, uh, um, um, especially in today's context, when you when you you know when you encounter something that has obviously been you know made by hand, uh, it's you know it lends a different weight and it you know kind of you know asks us to um, you know to think differently about that item and to you know really consider you know what its what its purpose is. Mm -hmm. um, I I, I um, and you know I don't think that that's ever. You know, I don't think that's ever going to go away. Um, if you look into um, um, into a um, Darwinian theory of uh, um, of you know craft and um, aesthetics, it's it, um, uh, it, it it's it's um, uh, it's something that has uh, uh, um, you know very very deep roots mm -hmm. in our history. So uh, uh, um, I think that people are always going to want to see things that are, that are handmade because they communicate in a, you know, in a different way. And, you know, they can tell a much different story than, you know, than what you can with just, you know, digital media. Mm -hmm. Exactly. There's something, yeah, innately human uh, to a handmade object, mm -hmm. which is indelible. And I think incredibly like, a vital part of, of the aspect. When we find pottery and you can see thumbprints in oh, the clay, yeah. that's one of the most chilling and also incredibly sort of heartening things to find. Mm -hmm. um, once I found a piece of Roman roofing tile that had a dog paw print in it. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's just these lovely things. We sort of, you see this progressive, sort of this constant human interaction with the ground and then you are then holding that as well. And it really adds something, I think, to the human experience as, so, as social right. creatures. And obviously, as I said before, Nick, you're a very, very creative guy. Uh, not only are even your Instagram captions beautifully written, um, but you write poetry, you, you draw, you've started creating images to even put on T-shirts, which are, you know, there's definitely a, a, a very 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 aesthetic graphic design component that you're fluent in as well so i i wanted to show everyone watching some of your your drawings and especially those which you sent which have a, a wonderful bridge between the visual work you do the drawings you do and your archaeological work so um the image i'm looking at now which will then 
put up on, on the screen for everyone watching later is um, it's the one with the Sphinx and the, the Pyramids of Giza in the background. And it looks like a, um, a, a, a gentleman beating the schnut out of someone with a gas mask. <laughs> it's yeah. pretty cool. So, the difference between the really, really you know, high contrast graphic figures in the front and then this like beautifully facilitated rendered Sphinx and pyramid in the background, which I'm, I'm guessing exemplify the type of draftsmanship we have to have in the field for archaeology. So I was just wondering if you could tell us a little bit about the narrative behind this drawing. I will absolutely do that. I'm just going to hang on. Sweating at my camera. So, <clears throat> so that picture um, is part of a series of pictures uh, tied to a short story I'm working on. Um, which I've been working on for a few years. I've never gone anywhere. I'm doing more art for it than I do writing for it. It's a, it's very pulpy. Um, the woman punching the gas mask person with the big <laughs> robot. Um, I really, I wanted to sort of write a narrative, sort of the kind of 1930s, 1940s sort of pulpy adventure comics that you would have got uh, which were effectively wartime propaganda uh, that were you that were distributed in America and Britain, and I used that artistic style to inspire this. And the narrative that is behind that is very similar to actually the man with the gas mask. There's a there's a standard behind him, uh, and on that is actually the logo of the um, Ahanaba Ahanaba. It was a um, an organization of archaeologists who worked for the Nazi Party. They were they were. Nazi Germany's very own archaeological division. And we learn about them a lot in archaeology because they're an example of archaeology being used for evil in as much that they had a political agenda to exercise with the, with the artifacts they found. And in doing so, interpreted every artifact they found in such a way that would reinforce um, Nazi ideology about... Um, sort of Aryanism, th things like that. Uh, and all this sort of very weird perceptions of the history of the world was was ultimately reinforced by the archaeology that the Ahanaba found because they were being, although they were technically archaeologists, they were being paid by, they were funded and entirely staffed by very loyal members of the party. Yeah. And yeah. I guess because I can't escape from archaeology, even when I try to like write a pulpy 1940s-esque adventure story about a woman from the Women's Air Corps, but with a robot arm, I cannot help but have her fight archaeologists. Uh, it's kind of like an inverse Indiana Jones. Uh, yeah. She's an American woman fighting German archaeologists. Um, and so I kind of drew this picture. She's got some British S SAS men behind her. And I drew it all in a very... Um, Sort of, I was inspired by Disney's wartime propaganda cartoons, actually, in the oh, style that they appear in. Is I watched a lot of the propaganda that uh, the Disney Corporation made uh, in the forties, and that's the style I drew them in. And the narrative does take place in Egypt because archaeology. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought right, I need to draw a backdrop to this, and then I drew one of my best ever sort of pictures of the Sphinx and the Pyramid, and I'm really proud of that backdrop. <laughs> I, I, I kind of look at that, I sort of think, why does it have to have this sort of very pulpy and ridiculous sort of science fiction propaganda story in the foreground? Because the background, like, if that was just on its own, I'd be so proud of that picture. <laughs> but I, I, think, I, I think it's cool. I think the, the stylistic differences between the two, the background and then the narrative happening in the foreground, I think that's really great. I think that shows a very astute visual decision. <laughs> I was really proud of that composition. It's why I sent it to you. I knew it's like, it's going to be hard to explain this in a way that isn't weird, but the composition I'm really proud of. Oh, um, cool. Yeah, quite a few of those pictures. I think I sent a few pictures through to you that are from that narrative, which is just me having fun writing a very pulpy story that's really cool about about fighting evil archaeologists <laughs> comes from our friend karis in long island new york and she asked 
what kind of missing gaps of information or of artifacts and evidence do you often find in archaeology and is there a way to fill in those gaps? So periods of human history where we don't have much example of artistic culture? Okay, um, there's a lot. Yeah. I mean, when it comes to archaeology, it's a lot like paleontology in that what we find in the ground is a tiny snippet of what life in that period would have looked like. Mm -hmm. um, depictions of the prehistoric world with the dinosaurs we've discovered are always delightful, but <clears throat> they do not show all the dinosaurs we have not yet found, which would have far outnumbered the ones we have. And it's the same with archaeology too. So we are given slivers of time. Mm -hmm. um, and I think an example comes to mind with Karis's question. Um, the Roman period in Britain, you know, even towards the fall of the Roman Empire, it's still a hub of culture and art that is very distinctive. And we all know Roman art and architecture. It's, it's very influential, it's very powerful uh, and very beautiful. Um, with the fall of the Roman Empire, Britain enters this, it's the Dark Ages, mm -hmm. um, when it comes under Saxon rule. And the Saxons gradually build up kingdoms that never ever quite come close to what the Romans had. And had the Roman Empire not fallen, I think the world would be very different how it was because the modern world is based mainly off the impacts of the kingdoms that built themselves out of the ashes of the fallen Roman Empire, but they completely missed the mark. And mm -hmm. if you think of like early Saxons in their poetry discuss stone halls of giants, and we know through archaeology that they're discussing abandoned Roman um, cities. Wow. But Saxons lacked the ability to build a multi-story house. So to see a multi-story house built out of stone, where all you can do is make a wattle and daub, wooden walled hut of one ellipse story, like it blew their minds. They couldn't comprehend that a human had done that. And when we do archeology span going to the Saxon period, we enter this weird death of art where so little is known about the Saxons because at least initially, they gradually form a culture that we come to recognize. The initial Saxons, they, they completely avoid, almost with a passion, Roman architecture and artistic style. They're almost making a point to not be Roman, mm -hmm. which has led some to believe that the Saxons in Britain were actually mercenaries working in Britain on behalf of the Romans. When the empire started before, the Romans said, you, you hold the fort here, we're gonna go back to Rome and sort out those problems. The Romans never come back and the Saxons sort of say, oh, this is our kingdom now. And we're going to be different to the Romans who enslaved us and forced us to come over and fight. Well, not necessarily enslaved, but we're going to be different from the empire that made us come here. Mm -hmm. And they, I, I excavated a house, a, a Saxon house, which is just a little, it's no larger than my room, just a little sort of square thing sunk into the ground. Two post holes would have been a wattle and daub wall with a thatched roof. On the other side of the river, was a Roman villa, which would have still been upstanding at the time the Saxons built their house. And the Saxons looted the Roman villa and used all the art and architecture of the Roman villa, broke it up and used it as clinker to hold up the post holes for the, the post supports in their houses. Mm -hmm. So they, they completely avoided and vandalized Roman art to effectively make it into the kind of loose stones you use to hold poles in place to hold your house upright. Mm -hmm. So this is just one example of things that exist across the world, these huge gaps where art stops. And sometimes it is just vandalized and there's a new culture that has no interest mm -hmm. in uh, furthering. Because sometimes, normally art is a progression, but sometimes it just ends mm -hmm. and it will take hundreds if not thousands of years for it to be properly understood again because there is this period where art takes on a totally different form, right. or in the case of Saxon, there's no art at all, really. Yeah, um, uh, people have different ways of expression of of expressing um, um, their ideas, and you know those ideas were in and out of popularity. And so, yeah, it, it, what 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 is considered art, you know, to one culture might be completely meaningless to another, and it's just you know a waste of good building material and uh, um, you know, but that's not to say that um, uh, maybe, you know, there were, you know, some sort of uh, 
um, um, a brooch or like you know, an expression of you know artistic value that happens through um, their, their 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 dress, you know, through fashion that just isn't accessible to us today, and we don't realize you know, you know, how deep their if they worked artistic expression. Went. Oh yeah, if they worked in fabrics or textiles or wood, we would never know. Right. Yeah. All we know is round. So you're absolutely right. You see the end of Roman pottery and carvings, and then this absence, but that does not mean art did not exist. Right. And it's another the I the human desire to create art I think is universal, but the human ability to appreciate art is incredibly um, subjective. Mm-hmm. And it, that will just be you have that throughout throughout history and across the world. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And, and, then, uh, and then we have from, from Martin Malund, Malund, and I hope I pronounced that correctly, given that I don't speak any Danish. Her he actually gave the pronunciation guide, but I have, sorry, Martin, I have forgotten to <laughs> look at it, look at it. Let's <laughs> call you Martin. So from, from Martin in Denmark, what's the most unexpected thing you found while on a dig? What, where was it and why was it unexpected? Unexpected is interesting um, because you can, especially, okay, I more knew what to expect going to Colin Bangra than I knew what to, than I ever know what to expect in my job in Britain because in Britain, mm-hmm. a, a contract will say we want to um, build a house on this land. And so we'll come in and dig. So there's never an indication of what will be in the ground. And you might be finding Bronze Age stuff, Roman, Iron Age, Medieval. Um, it really varies. Whereas going to Colin Bangara, um, we're, like, we're pretty confident we'll be looking at Japanese relics from circa 1943, which is a ridiculously precise in the world of archaeology. Um, so everything you find in archaeology is going to be pretty unexpected. Um, and I can think of two really good examples that are slightly different, but in the world of sort of traditional archaeology, as I do with the university here, mm-hmm. um, we were excavating a well um, not far north of Cambridge. And I love digging wells because every Roman well has treasure at the bottom of that. And that's a weird statement to make, but it's so true. Every well you ever dig will have something amazing at the bottom of it. Um, because most of the Romans in this part of Britain, in Britain, were actually Britons. They were pre-Roman people who had just adopted Roman customs because it benefited them to uh, become part of the empire. And often their traditional customs would be hybridized with Roman customs. So you're digging these Roman wells, but pre-Roman Britons would always throw um, relics or treasures Mm -hmm. into springs as sacrifices to water gods. And they keep doing this in the Roman Empire. They just start doing it with wells instead. Mm-hmm. Um, so every Roman well you dig in Britain is going to be made by Britons who are maintaining their pre-Roman religions. The Romans were very open that anyone could believe whatever they liked, <clears throat> so long as they paid taxes to Rome. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we were digging a Roman well, and we knew there'd be hopefully something good in there. And we saw what looked like the side of a plate sticking out. And we first thought it was probably a porcelain, or not porcelain, like a, a, a clay, a fired clay plate. As we got a little bit closer and started washing it off, um, we started to realize it was made out of metal, a very fine, thin metal. We thought maybe it was pewter. And eventually we, we were very careful. We dug the entire thing out. So it was surrounded with a lump of earth with a plate in the middle of it because we didn't want to damage it. And it went back to the lab to be cleaned with acetone, which is what you use to clean metal, prevent it rusting. Mm -hmm. And we discovered it was a silver dish. It's perfectly preserved. One corner has been bent over, but apart from that, it's a perfectly preserved silver dish uh, with a very sort of fine, just a couple of concentric circles engraved into the middle of it. And that was, it was unexpected because you never know what to expect when you're digging, but it was incredibly exciting because it's the closest I've come as an archaeologist to finding treasure. Mm-hmm. Um, I made a lot of I made a lot of very exciting discoveries, um, and I just remember another one in another well I was digging. I found a wooden arm, and that is the other that is the other a- anecdote that I actually wanted to tell. And it's again about oh, wells. Please, <laughs> we, we found a, a wooden arm, and it was coming from the shoulder down to the yeah, as shaped like this um like that 
uh, with, with the hands making that kind of shape. Uh, and it was, I found it, because we were digging a, another Roman well elsewhere, and we'd reached the anaerobic layer. So that's, that's actually stuff that fell into the well while it was in use that's now been covered in dirt. And all the water in there is preserved 2,000 year old pieces of wood and bone normally, because there's just no oxygen, so there's no bacteria, nothing's decomposed. So you're pulling out wood that is about 1,800 to 2,000 years old um, out, of, out of the base of this well. And we were at this point where like, we were below the water table, so water was pouring in as we we're trying to pull out stuff. And we're being a little slapdash and careless. And I remember I sort of reached into this black, silty water. And I just pulled out this arm. And for a moment, my heart stopped because I'd just been thinking, like, we never find bodies. It'd be great to find a body. And then I pulled out this arm and I panicked. And then I thought, no, it's just wooden. Uh, so I did the, the proper archaeological thing of waving to my friends with it and then pretending to shake their hands with it. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, guys, I found an arm. And then the supervisor of the dig, it looked so much like an arm. No one thought it could possibly be an arm because also there is no precedent to finding wooden Roman carvings because it's such an old period, you never find that. Yeah. So no one believed it could possibly be an arm because such a thing had never been found. And it, was, it looked so much like one that we're probably just imagining it, but we, it was it sent back to the lab and people had looked at it. The wood expert came in and then wood experts from other companies started coming in. Uh, and it was progressively realized that this was indeed a carved wooden arm. And it was rather interesting because it had once been a branch shaped like this with a twig coming off there and then the main branch going up that way. And then someone had carved that twig into a thumb and then that into four fingers. Um, and they could often tell by the way the wood was growing that this wasn't cut. So effectively, someone had seen a branch and thought, that looks a little bit like an arm and carved it into an arm. And this was at my old company. And they the ultimate conclusion was that it was part of a larger statue. Um, but I reject that it was part of a larger statue because the fact the entire thing is carved from a single branch, mm -hmm. either there's a tree that looks like a human, but I can't imagine a sculptor carving an arm that look, from a branch that looked human-like and then attaching to, a nut, to the rest of the sculpture. I think, it, I think it was carved in isolation. There's also mm -hmm. no... it was smooth there there's no clear way it would have connected into the rest of a body mm -hmm. yeah. and coming back to Breton beliefs a lot of springs that were worshipped by pre-Roman Britons um, had very little bronze and um, uh, iron carvings of body parts and often if a child was born with a uh, deformed body part if you broke a body part you would sacrifice these little offerings into the spring and hope that this would ultimately mean that the deities made your body better. And my, sus my suspicion is that this wooden arm is an example of a later, now Roman, but still culturally Briton person carving a wooden arm that has been thrown into the well, mm -hmm. uh, possibly because a family member had a deformity or an injury that they were hoping would be cured by performing this ritual sacrifice. Um, Wow. So those are some of the most uh, surprising things we found. There's plenty of surprising things in Columbangara too, um, but that's sort of a different kind of surprising. We sort of knew what to expect, but we were surprised by the sort of fine comb analysis we ultimately got. I thought I would find Japanese ruins. I found more than Japanese ruins. I found the artifacts specifically belonging to the eighth combined special naval landing force to get that level of we know exactly which men would have been in these tunnels. That was surprising in and of itself. That's because it, it, almost, it puts a face to the artifact, which is a very different kind of archaeology. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that's incredible. And it, again, it's so cool to hear about the accusation of the Breton and the, the Roman mm. cultures because with my mom being from Cuba, so many similar things happened in Latin America and the Caribbean. You know, mm. Layers of synchronicity that that it, it, it's just again it's it's kind of beautiful to think that that just proves us that human beings always kind of adapt and interject their own levels of familiarity with even you know new environments or or perhaps in this case new new you know it, it, it you know very various circumstances for various cultures but it's uh, again it, it kind of follows that idea of you know we don't. We don't really change that much. That's the beauty of our 
archaeology, that's the beauty of art, is a way of preserving and stressing that humanity, that, that constant humanity, no matter how tumultuous or different the world is, you know, we have something inherent that roots all of us. Yeah. That's really yeah. Cool. It's true. It's, yeah. I, I think I'd probably piddle myself if I would have reached in and grabbed the arm. I don't think it would have been a very dignified day in my life. <laughs> I felt very scared for a second. We'd just been talking about bog bodies, which are those bodies that <laughs> have been preserved by anaerobic. And so like they're they're effectively mummies that you find in swamps around Britain. Um Sometimes they've been sacrificed, sometimes they've been murdered. Sometimes the bodies are relatively recent and sometimes they're from the Bronze Age, but their state of preservation is always the same. So they're very oh. hard to date and very alarming to find. Yeah. Was it like, was it like slimy? It was slimy and the wood itself was actually very soft. One of the, um, oh. yeah, one of the contractors, one of the um, construction workers came over and I sort of said, look, I found an arm. He said, that's a dinky thing. And he picked it up by the thumb and snapped the thumb off. And I'm like, no, because as even, even me, like waving to people, pretending to shake their hands, we all did it with reverence and care. Yeah. But if you're not an archaeologist, you don't quite realize how delicate some of these things are. <laughs> <laughs> you're bad. And then rumors spread that I was the one that snapped the thumb off because his name was also Nick. And so word got out that Nick broke the thumb and Nick found the artifact. I'm like... <clears throat> Two different nicks. <laughs> All right. So, you know, a really, really great question from Kirsten and a story in New York that I think everybody watching should play, pay close attention to is when I find a small artifact, what is the appropriate action I should take? Is it not mine because we place value on it? What determines if an artifact has, an artifact, a found artifact has value? So I guess, yeah, first starting with, if we were to find uh, an art, uh, what, what we think is an artifact, what should we do? What's the responsible act? So that, um, <clears throat> it's a good question. It's a hard one to answer because it varies from country to country and culture to culture mm -hmm. uh, and time period to time period. In Britain, if you are finding artifacts, um, if you stumble across an artifact uh, in a farmer's field, the farmer has rights to that artifact unless they agree to share it with you say that you're not the farmer mm -hmm. um if it is anglo-saxon or older and if it is more modern medieval or later then that belongs to the government technically and it is their discretion as to whether you keep it or whether it is put into a museum or into an archive but the older things get um the less governmental possession exists and it is literally the landowner Mm -hmm. Or my, and it is literally the landowner who um, gets to decide what happens uh, to it. Um, and if you're finding sort of like dinosaur bones, for example, that is there's no discussion about that. That just belongs to whoever owns the land in which the artifact was found. Oh, um, I don't know about the case in America, but I know for a fact in New Zealand, New Zealand archaeology is very difficult because um, if you're doing archaeology that is not exclusively into the colonial into colonial buildings then you're doing archaeology uh, of the maori and the maori are still a current and very mm. influential powered uh, part of new zealand society culture and politics mm -hmm. and the thing is with the maori is that they can trace their ancestry and lineage back to um nearly every every single uh, urupa or cemetery in new zealand even pre even ones that haven't been recorded that are stumbled across uh, are within tribal lands and those tribal uh, groups still exist and they can trace their lineages back. Uh, so in that case, it's not archaeology if you cannot dig up an Urupa, you cannot dig up a cemetery um, uh, for a, a Maori cemetery uh, at all. It's tapu, it's sacred land mm -hmm. and not without Maori permission, but I do doubt they would give that uh, because for them that is still as important now as it was however many hundreds of years ago when it was made, even if it has been forgotten or is not recorded in the Maori prior to European arrival or an oral history. So there, it's not like everything has been mapped out and located, but that mm -hmm. everything found uh, that is Maori belongs to the current tribal groups who can trace lineage back to it. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that is the other thing. If there is a group or a family who can claim possession of what has been found, mm -hmm. uh, then it is theirs. If there is no one who can claim it, but it is 
more modern in Britain at least it is governmental and if it is very old and has no connection to anyone uh, then it is the landowner's uh, right to decide what to be done with it and this varies from country to country uh, I think it is slightly different in America mm -hmm. um, and I don't think uh, Native Americans have the same level of possession of uh, Native American artifacts found by archaeologists as the Maori do in New Zealand. So I think mm -hmm. it varies again, because uh, I know lots of um, archaeologists in America who talk about finding um, uh, Native American arrowheads and things like this. Mm -hmm. And when you when you go back to sort of sixteen thousand or twelve thousand years, the earliest Native American arrivals. I mean, I don't think any modern Native American groups can trace their lineage to the earliest arrivals to come across the land bridge, but mm -hmm. Native American arrowheads go right up to almost the modern era. And a lot of archaeologists will look into this and I don't believe um, there is the same level of possession uh, of those artifacts maintained with the indigenous people as there is in New Zealand. So I think it does vary case by case and country by country, making it a very hard and very political question to yeah. try and answer. Yeah, that's really good to know, though, for anyone interested, then they should definitely try to look up their local government website and get an idea. And New Zealand is now being much more, we're having a much better track record in dealing with their indigenous populations than a lot of other places, unfortunately. But it's interesting for us in Florida, because you have a very, very new economy, a relatively young state, but you've had people living on the peninsula of Florida for that years. So there's always um, shell mounds and different things uncovered. And, and even I've thought about it, you know, seeing different things on the ground around, like, you know, that could very, very well be, you know, an artifact or something that isn't just, you know, it, 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 it can have a to do it. So I think, I think this question is, is excellent, especially in the United States, but yeah, we definitely have New Zealand's track record on being respectful of I mean, New Zealand's not perfect, but yeah, it, it does have a <clears throat> better than most colonial history. It still has a colonial history, which isn't great, but it has a better than most one of them. Yeah. And then, um, let's see. So this, this is another really interesting question too. Um, we often view the paintings and sculptures as a sign of wealth, correctly so. And then she asks, but what kind of art were regular people creating during the period as you excavate? So this is art being made by everyday normal people, um, rather than people making art for patron, patrons like we're familiar from the Renaissance, sort of, is that the... I think is that, that, since, since your specialization, or, or at least since you've done so much work with Roman art, maybe, um, you know, for example, the, the, the villas in Pompeii and Herculaneum had these exquisite mosaic works and these, these wonderful murals painted in the courtyards. Obviously, those were very nice homes, very lovely properties. For a regular citizen living during that time, what would 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 what kind of would their closest thing to be able to create artwork or something decorative something aesthetic would that have been manifested in and of itself or maybe more integrated into the everyday objects that they used it would often be integrated into everyday objects a lot of rome is told through its pot pottery mm -hmm. uh, and there's a particular type of, pot type of pottery called samian ware which comes from the samian valley i want to say it's italian in origin or is it from Gaul. It's from continental Europe mm -hmm. um, and it is an incredibly highly prized type of pottery that you find in a number of wealthy homes uh, in Italy and also in the homes of, Ro of wealthy Romans, either traders or local uh, imperial representatives in Britain have Samian ware, which is sort of bright orange it's incredibly hard firm very thin but very strong there is no inclusions which means if you look at a broken matrix of it there's not uh, bits of uh, stone and dust it's the finest kind of clay that they've been able to craft this out of mm -hmm. and so that's called samian ware and then what you find a lot of in britain is fake samian ware oh, which to all intents and purposes looks to be samian ware but if you look at it in profile if you, if you tap your finger on it it doesn't ring quite the same way. It's a little bit rougher made. And this is being made by uh, Romano-Britons 
uh, mm. who are impersonating Roman symbols of wealth in their own creation. So whether they're trying to sell it as black market Samian ware, or whether it's just the idea of having very finely wrought bright orange pots is a sign of wealth for the Romans and the locals are sort of saying, well, we'll emulate that in our own way. And we'll, we'll, mm. we'll sort of, reflected and sure it's not from Samia but it's it still looks and feels the same and so this is an example of pottery being made by people who are obviously going to be they're more common because mm -hmm. if they were Roman aristocracy they would have real Samian ware they wouldn't have to make their own but I think there was actually a very successful fake Samian ware industry in Britain because a lot of people wanted to dress themselves and present themselves with the finery of the empire even though they're right at the edge of it and a lot of them don't have much influence within the empire. So what they would do to emulate that is create their own versions of it. So it's a recreation of wealth with their own resources. It's kind of like how nowadays, you, you know, if you can't shell out tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions for a, a Monet or a Picasso, you might have a poster instead. Exactly. Yes, exactly. Or it's like wearing off-brand uh, clothing. So it mm -hmm. doesn't quite say Nike. It says spiky or something like <laughs> like the idea of like knockoff clothing and off-brand things which are almost as good and look pretty much the same yeah. but cost half as much has been around for as long as humans have been and another example of what humans make is <clears throat> if we go to the paleolithic uh which is where i did my degree and if we look at the pre-human hominids that inhabited uh, Europe. Before the expansion of Homo sapiens out of Africa, you have Homo neanderthal lensis living in Europe. And before even them, you have Heidelbergensis. And I found a hand axe uh, almost a year ago now, uh, lying in the ground. I, I sent you a photo of that as well. It's a, you know, sort of large in the hand. Mm -hmm. And this would have been made not by a human, but by an ancestor of what would later become Homo sapien. And when you look at this hand axe, the interesting thing is early humans make identical hand axes too, because evolution is not a cut and dry project, um, progress. It's a very long transition. So they continue the artistic styles uh, of uh, previously um, archaic hominids. But when you look at this hand axe and hand axes are sort of some of the it's not even art because there's a lot of debate whether Homo sapiens is the only species of human to ever produce art. And that's a whole discussion in its own right. And it's very complicated as to whether Neanderthal had a conception of art or if it's a unique, uniquely human gift that we can even perceive art. Mm -hmm. But a lot of pride and care and what you put into artworks is put into stone hand axes. Uh, and there's an entire industry around that. And even Homo ergaster, which is the earliest, among the earliest of the genus Homo, they were making hand axes in Africa that get up to about this big. Wow. Out of, they're impossible to lift. And you sort of think, how, why would people have been making a... Because effectively, a, an axe is a prosaic tool. It isn't inherently artwork. But when you look at an axe this large, mm -hmm. you think... There's no purpose for that other than for it to have been a spectacle. And there's another example of a, uh, I think it's a, I think it's a Homo heidelbergensis hand axe. I saw it online uh, recently, very much like the one I found. It's made out of flint and flint can be chalky and flint can sometimes have fossils in it. And this hand axe, which is teardrop shaped, has a shell in the middle of it. And you can tell that the prehistoric person pre-human, pre-homo sapien, mind you, has napped the hand axe to make a tool to cut with, but they've cut it in such a way that they never touch the shell in the middle. So there is a shell surrounded, so they've obviously, they have an eye for artistry. Um, and to answer Kirsten's, and that, I think that that's phenomenal, that particular hand axe, because there is no practical reason to keep the shell on the hand axe other than you as the hand axe creator, the napper, looking at your axe and sort of saying, I like that. It looks really nice. It gives my my hand axe a little bit of joie de vivre. I like it. I'm going to keep it, which is a very, it implies they're capable of creating art, artwork. Mm -hmm. um, and this was an industry that not all humans would have been napping tools. There would have been nappers within every human and pre-human community who are presumably making the tools for everyone else. But mm -hmm. everyone kind of 
gave it a go and you can actually tell when novices and children try to nap their own tools oh. um, in Paleolithic settlements. You can sort of see that like around the fire, that's where the best hand nappers were. Uh, they're making the best stone tools and out towards the edges you have novices, you have half finished axes, you have axes that then broke them down the middle and left them to the side. You have children trying their hand. You can deduce this all by looking at hand axes. So that's another example of, this is before the idea of aristocracy even exists. This is before the idea of wealth is even a thing. It's a time when art is almost the only indicator of wealth and everyone is producing hand axes, but some people keep the shells on their hand axe at a time when we're not even sure if they even comprehend what makes something interesting, what makes it artistic, but we can already start to see these kind of thought processes manifesting in a skill set that some, everyone was expected to do, but some could do better than others. Mm -hmm. But before you even have concepts of wealth, you have hand axes, which are an artistic tool. And that's a whole thing, which I'm kind of butchering in my descri description right now. No, it, it, really, it really highlights very well how art almost um, helped them establish early forms of hierarchies in a way. Yes. You know, mm. that's, that's oh, yeah. really fascinating. That's so, it's, well, you, it's, it's just... I you can even see how, like... The further away from the fire you get, the worse the hand axes become. So clearly the best hand axe makers are the ones who get the privilege of sitting closest to the fire. So you see this hierarchy developing through the creation of art um, at a time when hierarchy in most ways would barely have existed. Yeah. Wow. That's really fascinating. That's really fascinating. And I think on that note, um, We'll wrap up. So, Nick, thanks again for joining us. Yeah, thank you. Thanks so much. Oh, no problem. Yeah, yeah, you're not kidding. So informative. So cool. And yeah, thank you to everyone watching for joining, too.